Welcome to St. Giles, and thank you for coming. It's my huge privilege to introduce Father Gerard Hughes, who really needs no introduction, frankly, but um, if you haven't come across his books, you've really missed out. So <laughs> I suggest you go hot foot to black holes or something, and at least find, find a god of all the lives, or god of surprises. There are, there are lots of them. Uh, Father Gerard is going to do something called the exam review, which will be familiar to some of you, perhaps not all. And all I can say is that if you do this, your life will be changed. It's that good. Well, a welcome to you all. And after that introduction, all that I can do is disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> but very briefly, I'm going to talk about, it's really about the spiritual exercises, but the important thing, one of the important things in the spiritual exercises, they were written by this man, Ignatius Loyola, who had never done any training. He hadn't been on a training course, God help us. <laughs> Never mind a, a doctorate in spirituality in Berkeley, here in California. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, he wasn't trained at all. But he had these experiences and he felt these are these are worth doing. He was consulting his own experience what he was going to. And he wrote it down, and with the help of the scriptures, he, he made discoveries, and he wanted to spread them. Now the importance of the man is, in our church today, we're in great crisis, not just the church, it's religion in general, for the first time in history. Christianity has to face this crisis of we're living in a postmodern society, a post-Christian society. How do we carry on, etc.? And Ignatius is extraordinarily important for our days to get us in touch with our experience, your experience, not Ignatius's and not mine, but yours, because that is where God is. And we live in a culture where we're so reliant on the expert. The ordinary person says, well, I mean, I, I just don't know. I just have to follow the experts. And we become like zombies. Whereas, there's a great treasure within ourselves. So characteristic of his spirituality is it is earthed. By that I mean it's in your own experience. And it's out of your experience you pray. Why? Because that is where the Spirit of God is for you. And that's the, the, the center of our faith. So instead of giving you a long lecture on the spiritual exercises or this dreadful word examine, I'm just going to, we're going to do it. And then you can decide whether it's any use or not. But if you don't do it on your own, then this lecture is a waste of time. You know, it might be quite interesting. You'll forget it tomorrow. Whereas if you keep doing this exercise, you'll find things are happening in you. Nothing startling. Not visions, not levitations. At least, not likely. Just, you gradually find you're seeing things differently. And the only way any of us can change the world ourselves is by beginning to see things differently. So instead of chattering on, we're going to start straight away. And you're going to be doing this. Forget about notes. Don't bother with any notes. There are some handouts coming later. The only thing to notice is if anything gets you in the feelings and sort of lifts you up or throws you down, notice what it was. 
Notice the feedings. They are <coughs> extraordinarily important. And Ignatius, in his exercises, puts enormous emphasis on that. Just notice, not judge them, not analyze them, just notice. I felt bored out of my mind. Very important, he's saying more than you think. Well, I was, ooh, I was, I was really enlightened by that. Look at it. It's telling you something. But I'm going to stop talking and we're going to start working. And the first thing is, in all prayer, this is a prayer at the end of the day. Preferably. It doesn't have to be. And it's a prayer which is based on your experience of the day. You know, what sort of day it has been. Because it's in that day that you meet God in every experience. So, the first thing to do is just calm down a bit. Be still and know that I am God. Now, I'm going to do a brief stillness exercise with you. Describe it briefly, then you do it. And it will be very brief. But you can get the hang of it even in a few, in a couple of minutes. Sit with your feet plonked firmly on the ground. Have your back reasonably straight, but not rigid. But you're feeling relaxed. But the feet plonked firmly on the ground is for some reason quite important. And the back reasonably straight. And now, it's just to be still. I remember the first time I did this, I read a book. It said the superior form of prayer is absolutely still, without thoughts, without imagining, just stillness. How wonderful stillness is, says the book. And I remember trying this and having half an hour of torment. Because when I tried to be still, it was like issuing an invitation to every interesting thought, image, memory I'd ever had. And they all came crowding in. And I ended up exhausted, ready to bite the head off the next person who came, which is not really the fruit you expect of prayer. So what we're going to do is just stillness. A way of stilling the mind, focus simply on this. What can you physically feel in the body? Start with your right foot, if you like, and slowly move through. You're not analyzing. You're just noticing what physically you feel. That's all. Now, thoughts will come in. And I want to give you the difference between thoughts and feelings. I can start this exercise. I can feel a slight tingling in the toes. That's what I feel. Right, focus on that. And stay with it as long as you can. But then the thought comes, could be circulation problems. <laughs> <laughs> Better see the doctor. <laughs> and then, quick move, I'm on the operating theatre. <laughs> And in no time, it's my funeral. <laughs> you know, in a way, the, the secret of this exercise is focus on physically what you can feel. What a waste of time. Well, it's a waste of time, but just waste of time. And just physically feel, that's all. And if you hear noises or coughing, etc., <coughs> acknowledge, right, noise and coughing and get back to the feeling. Is that simple enough? It's just notice. Your body, that's all. And if you can stay with your big toe the whole time, you've done very well. <laughs> you don't have to go right, do all the syllabus. So we shall start being still. This will be very short.
in God we live and move and have our being. Where is God? God is where we are. And each one of you can say, God is where I am. And that is the only place I can find God, where I am. Dear God, still our minds and open our hearts so that we can recognize you in every event of our lives. And we ask you this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, those sort of stillness exercises, you can do on your own. You can do them anywhere. You can do them when you're walking. You can do them on the bus, etc. Just focusing on the body. It seems a waste of time, but do, and you will understand. That's an old Jewish motto. Do, and you will understand. So practice it, and you'll see its value. Now, to do this, review of the day at the end of the day, very briefly. All of us at uh, work, at any rate, do you find this? If you had a fierce row during the day, a really fierce row, before you go to sleep, what happens? Well, naturally, most of us rehearse the row in great detail. And precisely what he said or she said and how I answered, etc. And we go through the row, and we get into a bad row again, etc. But it's a natural process. It's to use this wonderful process of reflection. Just look at the day, but look at it simply. What did you enjoy? It may have been a ghastly day for you, but was there anything in it? which was reasonably enjoyable. Anything that made you smile, that's all. Just look at the things which you appreciated, you valued. Just look at them. Why are you looking at them? Because, in fact, all those things, in God you live and move and have your being, those things that pleased you are gifts given to you and those gifts are a sign God's life is a life of giving, wants to share God's very life with us. That's the, the heart of our faith. It's God's love, God's goodness pervades everything. And so it's to recognize it in the tiny things that have pleased you during the day. It can be ridiculous things, um, tiny things, like somebody smiled, or see a child hopping around, as I saw this morning in the meadows. Uh, absolute delight in life. And it was such a lovely thing to see. I was grateful for that. So that's all you have to do. And in fact, this is your way to salvation, to put that into heavy religious language. As one early theologian put it, sin is forgetfulness of God's goodness. So just now, we're going to spend a few minutes just pondering the last 24 hours, anything you like. What was it? Get back into it. Enjoy it. Relish it. Appreciate it. And then maybe say, thank God. That's all.
So we'll do that for a few minutes. In the celebration of the Eucharist, there's this marvelous prayer, and it says, begin very solemnly. It is our duty, and it leads to our salvation, that we should, and you expect something like, avoid sin at all costs. That's not what it says. It says, it is our duty, and it leads to our salvation, that we should thank you always and everywhere. That's a marvelous thing. That's what we have to do. Now, when you say, think a little bit about that, if I thank someone for something, when is it sincere thanks, and when is it just doesn't mean anything? It's sincere if I thank somebody because I appreciate who they are, I appreciate something they've done, something they've made, etc., it's based on appreciation, value, cherishing something, then I can say thank you, sincerely. Ignatius in these spiritual exercises begins, very solemn beginning, um, it's just a, an introduction to them, and he's saying we are created. What's the point in life? <coughs> You are created to praise, to reverence, and to serve God. Well, what on earth does that mean? Does it mean I've got to, you know, God a voracious appetite for flattery? I've got to be bowing all the time saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. But you say, thanks is based on appreciation. Therefore, you could translate that phrase of Ignatius and say, we are created to appreciate, value, cherish 
creation. Because then we can, we can really genuinely with our hearts thank God. And the Jew, one Jewish writer has written a wonderful thing. He says, for the final judgment, God is going to have one question and one question only. And the question will be, did you enjoy my creation? And if the answer is, no, I was far too busy studying the spiritual exercise. <laughs> <laughs> then you're for trouble. <laughs> So we're doing this rather hurriedly, but it's just to show you the method, and there'll be a handout reminding you what, you know, the outward structure of this exercise. But it's just that the, the beauty and the wonder of things. And we think today, you know, get all this religion or science. Science is doing a most wonderful job, particularly the, the good scientists who write ladybird books for people like me who <laughs> don't quite know what's going on and they explain and the incredible mystery in which all of us are living at this very moment each one of you literally trillions of cells in your body and each cell has an intelligence each cell has a role in the body and each cell in your body is utterly unique to you. Hence, fingerprints, voice prints, DNA. And if you leave any of them behind, you can get caught if you committed a crime. But that's extraordinary. Each individual is different. And there are trillions of these cells. How on earth do the cells know what to do with the cup of coffee and the biscuits? How do you apportion what comes in and through the body says it grows in proportion, grows at all, and gives us the energy to think? This utter mystery in which we are, we didn't create it. We just find we're landed with it. <laughs> but that um, importance of that prayer at the end of the day, just thanking God. And this God is a God who we talk of eternal God. And you think God going on and on and on, and we are faced with after death going on and on and on. But God is not in time. God is not restricted by time, which means, which means God is always in the present. And the God who spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the God who at this moment is holding you in being. It is the same God. The wonder of it. And just that prayer of thanksgiving, which we've done so rapidly, um, but you can practice that on your own. Now, before we go on to the next part of this review of the day, so the first part is simply thank you, God, that's all. The second part, this is by way of introduction, I want to read you a little poem, um, and it's by a man called Charles Peggy, Frenchman, politician, left-wing socialist, French, um, and He'd given up his Christianity, but he went on a pilgrimage to Chartres one day, just outside Paris, and he had a conversion. And as a result of his conversion, he continued as a left-wing politician, but he took up writing poetry. And it was very risky poetry, because he was pretending he was God, and he was writing to chat with us as human beings. And here is a, one of his poems, it's called God's Dream. And here it is, God speaking. I myself will dream a dream within you. Good 
dreams come from me, you know. My dreams seem impossible. Not too practical. Not for the cautious man or woman. A little risky sometimes, a trifle brash perhaps. Some of my friends prefer to rest more comfortably in soundless sleep with visionless eyes. But from those who share my dreams, I ask a little patience, a little humor, some small courage, and a listening heart, and I will do the rest. Then they will risk and wonder at their daring, run and marvel at their speed, build and stand in awe of the beauty of their building. You will meet me often as you were, in your companions who share the risk, in your friends who believe in you enough to lend their own dreams, their own hands, their own hearts to your building. In the people who will stand in your doorway, stay a while, and then walk away knowing they too can find a dream. There will be some filled days and sometimes it will rain. A little variety, both come from me. So come now, be content. It is my dream you dream, my house you build, my caring you witness, and my love you share. And this is the heart of the matter. Um, I've got a few copies of that poem, but I hope you can, you know, next week you can get more if you need them. Um, but that dream of God, that dream of God, it's in your dreams, and therefore, a most interesting question to keep asking yourself basically, basically, fundamentally, what do I want from life? Can I face that question? What do I want? What's my idea? If I could wave a magic wand and have one basic wish, what would it be? Keep asking you that, and if you get it, clear answer this evening, then there is little we can know for certain, but you can know this for certain, your answer is wrong. <laughs> because you will find the next day, no, no, you're going down the levels of your being to try to find what is it basically I really want. And to try to find that is so important because it's down there you will find God's will. And we've done awful things with God's will. Keep on saying, oh, well, it's God's will. Well, I imagine once marriage service. And this is uh, the modern uh, marriage service, and the, the, the bride and the groom are encouraged in some places to make up their own vows. So you have this wedding, this has been done, and the bride comes down and the organ is playing, etc. It's all very solemn. And then she meets her beloved at the, uh, at the end of the walk down the aisle. And the, whoever is doing the wedding invites the groom to express his love for his beloved. Yes, he clears his throat first of all. <coughs> I love you very much, my dear, he says. But do realize from this moment onwards, I'm not at all interested in what you want or desire. The important thing for you is to do my will. And if you do, you shall have a very happy ma ma marriage and eternal bliss thereafter. If we do not, the man will be miserable and you will be damned. <laughs> so having uttered this great love, <laughs> the president then turns to herself and says, 
and will you take this man to be your loving husband? <laughs> Please God, she says, certainly not, under no circumstances. <laughs> but it's often done with God's will. And so God's will is something totally opposed to ours. And you can get that message so good into one, that you think if you're enjoying yourself, you must be doing something wrong. You should be doing God's will. But what if God's will is that you should discover what you really deep down want? Because that is what God created you for. And why he made you different from everyone else. And he wants your good and your longing. And therefore it is important, keep searching for it. Keep asking, basically, what do I long for? And a good method of doing this is imagine when you're dead and gone, what would you like to have on your epitaph? He never lost an argument in his life. <laughs> he made more money than anyone else in a shorter time in the whole country. Would that really delight you? What would delight you? Then Try to find the words, and however impossible it seems, if that's what you want, write it down and keep looking at it. Because it's there, it's the heart of the matter, it's where you meet God in that deep down desire. Now, having said that, that was by way of introduction to the second part of this review of the day. Because you might have been thinking, well, it's all very well, so how nice everything is, you know, uh, and beautiful. What about the mess of life? What about the chaos? Don't worry, we're coming to that now. <laughs> and what about sin? So, just with that background of, of that I give them that poem, the second part of this review of the day is look at your moods and feelings during the day. What were they like? Just in general. What were your moods and feelings? Now I'll do a role play for you and then uh, you can do it for yourselves. But it's just to look at, don't judge. Avoid moralizing like the plague. One Jewish writer has written, nothing so masks the face of God, he said, as religion. Well, I've often thought, nothing so masks the face of God as moralizing. And you'll see why in a moment. It's not I'm against moralizing, but it's just that it, it can do a lot of damage. You're looking at your moods and feelings. Right. So I look back on a day and say, moods and feelings, they were very good in the morning. They started breaking down a bit in the afternoon. And by this time of the evening, I feel thoroughly depressed. That's just moods and feelings. Now, instead of then saying quickly, Oh my God, I'm very sorry for having moves and feelings like that, and it, I will not do it again. Despite the little voice inside saying, you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> you say that, you think, well, it's all right. It isn't all right. You want to look at the moves and feelings. Why? Why did you have such a jolly morning and such a dreadful afternoon sinking into the depths of despair and I said, well, in the morning, I was working with a group of other people, and I proposed a way of setting about the work for the day. And we did this, and it went very well. And one of the group congratulated me on my planning, and said how much they had enjoyed it. So it was good, it was a very good morning. In the afternoon, I had further suggestions as to how we should proceed and suddenly contradicted me. <laughs> and in fact, they criticized me. 
And that's where the mood started getting wrong. And it just got progressively worse until I'm now in the pit of depression. <laughs> Question. We are created to praise, reverence, and serve God. Where has the center of attention been for me in that particular day? The center of attention for me in that particular day has been me. And when I have been congratulated, um, and when everything is going well, I can be nice to everyone. But when somebody starts criticizing, or suggesting I haven't done it quite so excellently as I thought, then there's turmoil inside. Why? Because the focus of my attention is not on God and God's creation and other people, it's on me. Havoc. Now, does that make sense? Can you? <coughs> so, what we're going to do now is just have a little try. And it's not uh, beating yourself up, etc. It's a question of just looking. Where was the focus of my attention? And that's why that poem of Peggy is so important. What is it basically that I want? To be praised, have other people serve me, and to be reverenced. <laughs> or is it that I should delight in God's creation? that somehow should be able to give life to other people and somehow have the capacity to love instead of worrying about how I'm thought of by others. So we'll spend a few minutes and you can just do that on your own. Don't worry, you're not going to be asked to explain it to the rest <laughs> of us. That's for your private business. So we'll spend a few minutes looking at that, just the moves and the feedings. And the question is, what is the desire which underlies all those moves and feedings? Because all our moves and feedings, underlying it is desire. When the desire is fulfilled, we are happy and content. When the desire is frustrated, we growl inside and take it out in others. So a few minutes just looking at moods.
<clears throat> and having done that, looking at moods and feelings, and seeing what was the desire underlying my moods during the day, I can thank God for the things that were created. But the things were all upset simply because somebody doesn't give me enough praise. I come before God and just say, deliver me from doing that in life. And blaming other people, etc. and putting myself in the center. I don't want to. But speak familiarly to God in that. And um, it's so important that familiarity with God is not out to, to, to make life difficult for you. But you're saying when you look at actually my behavior, I begin to see, or I'm shown, I talk about God, but really my heart is more centered on me. And I want to be liberated. I want freedom, etc. I want the gift of wonder. And to be able to tell that to God. And one of the very difficult things in, in the whole Christian life is the notions of God which we can get into our heads as though God is there simply to judge us <coughs> and spends his eternity with his notebook noting what we've done wrong, and then thinking out suitable punishments. Well, it's not the sort of God you want to hopefully chat with. Um, whereas the, the truth of God is a God who is far more anxious for our good than we are, and wants us to actually take, share, in his creative activity. A God who's constantly inviting us. And there's a most wonderful phrase in the Book of Wisdom, which was a late book of the Old Testament. And it was written for Jews who had left their country and were getting a bit out of touch with things. Yes. But it was also written in Greek in order that the pagans could read what God was like, the God of Israel. And there's one wonderful passage, and it's talking about God, and God loves all creation, otherwise he wouldn't have created it. And it says in the Jewish, uh, in the Jerusalem Bible, God overlooks our sins so that we can repent. Not God punishes our sins, God overlooks our sins. And you just think, imagine somebody, I've offended someone, and I've really, it was a nasty thing that I did to them. And I bitterly regret doing it. And I'm dreading meeting them again. But I do meet them, and they behave as though nothing had happened. Now, the effect of that reaction is to make me still more aware of the wrong thing I did to them. Whereas if he had attacked me, I would have had my defenses up straight away, justifying my attack. And in this, uh, the King James Version of the Bible, it translates that phrase beautifully. Not God overlooks our sins, it says, God winketh at our transgressions that we may amend. So it's good to have a conversation with that God who winketh at your transgressions um, and tell him you don't want the transgressions either. So I've now um, talked enough and I've got these um, copies of um, some of you, maybe be familiar with them, because I've written them dozens of times in different things. Some ways of praying. It's just some. Notice it's some ways. 
because the only person who can know one's way is you. You find your own way. But these ways can introduce you to ways of praying, and then you find a way that suits you. So if you'd like to give these out, and in this um, thing, there's review of the day comes right at the end. It includes stillness exercises, um, and it includes using your imagination in the scripture. But at any rate, you can give those out. And then having had this, are there any comments for the last few minutes that we've got? Comments you would like to make or questions you would like to ask? If you'd like to um, get any comments or questions, I'll come out and look after them. Or is it also absolutely clear? Please do not say. I'll give you a title for grace, if I can. At least he tried. <laughs> <laughs> is not a good thing. Um, sometimes it can be presented as, oh, we'll just offer it up, that will please God. I think it's a dreadful thing to say about God, as so though he's a masochist, a sadist or something. But no, it's the fact of God enters, becomes one of us, therefore enters into our pain, the pain of being a human being, and this God is with us even when we're in pain and therefore you don't try to deny your pain or say the pain I don't want the pain to go away you don't say that you just say I'm, I'm suffering this but show me you're there with me and it's out of that out of those things and test your own experience on this that often it's out of things which are very painful that we sort of get better insight into life, into ourselves, into other people. And it's not that pain itself is not good, but knowing that this God, there is no depth of rottenness that we can sink into where, as it were, God has not already been before us. Paul puts it. He made the sinfulness, he made the sinless one into sin for our sake, so that we might become the goodness of God. So God identifies God's self with us. And somehow in that pain, Lord, deliver me and deliver others from their pain too. And I know an extraordinary group in, in Birmingham. And there are people, all denominations and none. And what they have in common is chronic pain. And they meet regularly. And one of them is so affected with it and disabled that the only way she can communicate is through a little light on her forehead which she can beam onto a computer. 
and so communicate, and communicates <coughs> most wonderful stuff. Um, they know the depth of pain <coughs> these people, and they produce this extraordinary stuff. And they support one another down in the depths, and finding that great strength. Thank you. Christian or in certain patterns we think of punishing God. So it is very wonderful what you say about God overlooking our transgression. So because I think many people feel that your pain and your problems or your whatever you are going through comes because you are being punished for your transgression. You have that very strong, and it's, it's such a false image, as though God is a punishing God. Yeah. Now, right, you get that um, in, in, the, in, the, in the prophets, in God. Yes. But always, also in the prophets, they always end up with good news. And in Jesus himself, there is no notion of a punishing God at all. He's a God who, the, I mean, that parable of the prodigal son, God sees the son who led down the family, wasted everything, etc. And the father runs out to meet him and embraces him and doesn't listen to what he has to say, but orders the feast. That's the picture which Jesus gives of God. And I heard just recently of a man who was complaining about Rembrandt's famous painting of the prodigal son. Uh, it's a beautiful painting, but the son is a repentant, kneeling, and the father is beautifully clad and looking rather stuffy, but he's putting his hand on the head of the boy. And the man said, I, I think Rembrandt got it wrong, he says, because he says in the gospel, he ran out to meet him. And we project onto God some of the worst aspects of ourselves. We like punishing others, etc. And we think it does them good. So we think God must be like that. And thank God, God isn't. Not in Jesus, he's not. And not in the Psalms. It's wonderful to know that, um, you know, because you think, well, um, I'm suffering like a servant. Yes. So, in a way, you are not acknowledging his pain, but you say you acknowledge and feeling oh, yes. this, that, and the other. But I think what we try to do many is to say, I deserve this, I have you know, done wrong, so whatever I'm going through, I deserve it. Have mercy on me or whatever, but I deserve it, so you feel... But we, we damage ourselves in the end, and also then we damage other people. And we're not right to say, well, I am very, very sorry about that, but I don't think God is punishing me for it. It's, it's God's also greed, this God of love, who wants people to share in his own love. So, it, uh, it's, it's time to really, yes, we have to go. Can I ask you a question? Do you, do you want to be like God? Well, go out and wink at people's sin. <laughs> Change the world. <laughs> Just see the difference. Go and try. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.